thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And welcome to the very first of the 2021 Human Rights Center Fellowship Panel Talks. My name is Alexi Berlin. I'm the coordinator of the fellowship program. The Summer Fellowship Program is the oldest and longest running program here at the Human Rights Center. Since 1994, we have sent uh, and supported over 370 students, both graduates and undergrads, from all departments and schools of the university in doing uh, social justice and human rights oriented field work, both locally, nationally, and internationally uh, in over 80 countries and territories worldwide. It's an incredible program. I would like to invite any Cal students who are interested in this kind of work to learn more about and apply for the fellowship. Uh, you can learn more at our website, uh, humanrights.berkeley.edu. You can also sign up for our mailing list there or follow us on Twitter there. My colleague is going to share the link for the folks watching on Zoom. This is a great way to find out about upcoming events, latest news from the center. Hi, guys. Welcome. Come on in. Some right here. Hi, Alexi. Welcome, everybody. This chair is mine, but there's some more spots over here you can take. And there's some benches as well back here. Here and here as well. There's a nice spot here if you like. The application for the fellowship program will be available in late December. It'll be due in late February. So uh, join our mailing list or follow us to find out when it's available. Uh, we'll be having some information sessions in January to tell people more about it. And also, I'm always happy to meet with people and talk more about the fellowship and uh, past experiences and so forth. It's a wonderful program. Uh, also would like to let you know that there'll be another panel every Thursday for the next three Thursdays with the rest of our uh, fellows. This year's cohort of fellows, they're gonna be great panel right here. So please sign up for those as well. Thank you uh, to, uh, on our website. The students that you're gonna hear from today applied for this fellowship through a competitive process based on their proposals to work with organizations of their choosing uh, locally and around the world. We will hear about each fellow's work, followed by a question and answer session at the end. At that point, we welcome questions from the audience or from the folks watching on Zoom. Before we get started, I would like to thank two people uh, for their generous support of the fellowship program, Professor Patty Blum and Dr. Tom White. Without their generous support, we would not have had the resources to fund many of the fellowships uh, we present today and that we've had over the past recent years. I'd also like to thank uh, Brian Wynn, Andrea Lempros, Mary Mijares, and all the people here at the HRC that have made this event possible. Today's panel is entitled Communities in Conflict, the Right to Healthy Lives in the Face of Violence. Speaking today will be Sarah Abdelrahman. She's a master's of public health student at the School of Public Health here at UC Berkeley. Also Dr. Samantha Angriquez, a doctor of public health student also at the School of Public Health. Meher Wadhawan, she's a graduate of the political science department at UC Berkeley. Duren Fitos, or Fitos, uh, a graduate of the International and Global Studies program here at UC Berkeley. And finally, Helena Van Naj, who's a JD student right here at Berkeley Law. So with that, please welcome our panelists and Sarah Abdelham. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Sarah and I'm a second year MPH student at UC Berkeley. For my Human Rights Fellowship, I had the opportunity to lead my own case study on Idlib, Syria. This case study is part of a bigger ongoing project called the Syria Impact Study, which is led by Dr. Rohini Har at UC Berkeley. The goal of the study was to determine the public health impacts of attacks on health in Syria, and particularly look at the direct, um, direct targeted attacks on medical facilities and healthcare workers. One component of the study was to conduct qualitative interviews uh, with healthcare workers to understand their experience with health with attacks on healthcare. 
This, the, uh, this case study tells the stories of the health care workers that were interviewed from Idlib, Syria specifically, um, and the challenges that they faced, as well as the impact on the war and security on their personal and professional lives. So before I, I share with you the three, three specific <laughs> stories of the health care workers, I first want to summarize the key findings and themes that emerged from the stories of these healthcare workers. So first, many of the attacks on hospitals were directly targeted and resulted in destruction of health facilities and mass casualties among healthcare workers. Most of the healthcare workers experienced two or more attacks throughout the crisis, some of which were multiple attacks on the same hospital on the same day or over a few months. Services that were provided by destroyed hospital were replaced by nearby health facilities, which increased the pressure of these nearby health facilities. Civilians experienced exacerbated health conditions due to lack of hospital following an attack, and many of them feared approaching hospitals for healthcare. And healthcare workers experienced a sense of duty as professional, as health professionals to continue providing care despite particularly dangerous circumstances in hospitals. And finally, the hospital tax led to significant mental health, um, mental health impacts among healthcare workers, including exhaustion to, to shortages in resources and feelings of fear of attack and grief of loss of colleagues. Now, I would like to share with you the three stories of the healthcare workers, summarizing the attack they faced and direct quotes from the interviews. Oh. The first one is Ariha Hospital. It was attacked on January 28, 2020. So the attack on the hospital occurred in the morning. Hospital staff agreed not to work that day and postpone all cases, close all clinics, and only receive war injuries. There were there were sorry, there was an attack in the village around 5 p.m. and 20 people with injuries were brought to the emergency room at around 11:20 p.m. While the staff were resting and eating, the hospital was targeted and they were hit by a hospital door. The staff immediately went upstairs and gathered all the women, children, and patients in a secure place in the operation room underground. The hospital was targeted again. Windows, glass, stones, and blocks were all over the floor, and many of the staff were extremely injured, including the administrative director, who later passed away. After the attack, the hospital went out of service completely because there was no electricity or water to treat the patients. More than 150,000 civilians were displaced within 48 hours. A quote from the healthcare worker who summarized this attack said, while we were stitching a patient, the doctor came and told us that we have a surgical operation. He asked me to prepare for it. I told him that I was not feeling good as though something is about to happen. He agreed, but said, let us first perform this operation. I told him that I would not be able to help him. I was too anxious. My heart was pounding, so I asked one of my colleagues to fill in. I prepared the operating table, and they went in to replace me. This healthcare worker also said, when the hospital was bombed, not only me, everyone felt that life had stopped in Ariha. So all people had to leave the city, and this was the main reason for people displacement from the city because people said, if the hospital is bombed, there is no life after that. The whole area is gone. Hospitals are always the backbone of life. <clears throat> Idlib Central Hospital was attacked multiple times. They were attacked on March 23rd, 2017, May 12, 2018, March 13th, 2019, and February 25th, 2020. Idlib Central Hospital was targeted with raids from warplanes and remote controlled car bombs. The emergency unit was overcrowded with over 100 individuals. Four medical staff were injured by Sharpnail and nine civilians were killed. The attack destroyed hospital doors and windows. The hospital was closed at least one week after each attack. The patients and the visitors were referred to other hospitals outside of Idlib district because of this. And a quote from the healthcare worker that summarized this attack said, because of fear, people, especially during the bombing period, avoid going to a hospital, even if it's absolutely necessary. The death rate increased for expectant mothers, newborns, young children, and patients with hypertension and diabetes.
Mohammed Ibn Abdul Aziz Medical Institute was attacked on August 2016. The institute was bombed to target students who, were, who want to continue their education and train as healthcare workers. During this time, the healthcare worker was a student training with her brother and his pregnant wife. During the attack, her brother and his wife were targeted and were under the rubble, but were able to come out with no injuries. There were a total of 300 in the building during the attack. And the institute was unfortunately had moved from one area to another due to the targeting. And then a quote from this healthcare worker said that after the bombing, I had a nervous breakdown and I stayed in a state of shock for 10 days as I could neither sleep nor eat. I was always crying when someone talked to me. I developed a great fear of the whole area. I said it and I'm still saying it. I do not want to see Yurim on the map at all because of the difficult situation I was exposed to there. I had thoughts that I wanted to immigrate and I never wanted to stay in Syria. So I decided to leave as we are always bombed and we always live in a state of fear. Will we always live in this horror? I asked myself. So to conclude, these hospitals were directly targeted and resulted in hospitals coming out of service and mass casualties among healthcare workers and patients. And finally, these hospital attacks led to an increase in disease burden among civilians and mental health impacts, including fear among healthcare workers. So some next steps and things that we can do about this. I just thought everyone should be aware of the situation that's going on in Syria and the impact the conflict is having in the healthcare system and healthcare workers. And what we can do is also educate ourselves on this by just looking up the history of the conflict and also educating others on it. And specifically, if you guys want to look more about the stories of the healthcare writers that I just mentioned and more, you can check out my Idlib case study, which the link is right there. And finally, of course, everyone can donate. There are so many organizations that support the healthcare system in Syria and the healthcare workers. Uh, to name a few, International Medical Corp and Doctors Without Borders, they focus on supporting medical health workers in Syria by supporting them and training them and giving them resources and medical equipment. And Physicians for Human Rights and Amnesty International, they focus more on research in Syria by documenting attacks on healthcare facilities since the beginning of the conflict. That is all, thank you guys so much. Hello everyone, I'm Samantha Enriquez. I'm a doctorate of public health uh, from the School of Public Health here in UC Berkeley. And I'm gonna be presenting you Eyes on Chile, Police Violence During the Social Unrest in Chile, October, 2019. Yep. Sorry, we're a slide back. Let's see if I can. There I just want to dedicate this presentation to Denise Cortez, a human rights activist just the, that this was deceased last Sunday in Chile. I want to tell you a story. Oh, sorry. I have two things going on. So I'm sorry. Um, I want to tell you a story about what happens when history catches up with you and hits you in the eyes. I grew up in Santiago de Chile in a very quiet place. I remember the city being calm and safe. My parents' generation learned to be quiet. They learned that if they were loud, they could disappear. It was on September 11, 1973, when a coup d'etat directed by the armed force overthrew the elected president Salvador Allende. Allende died that day in La Moneda Palace. And so it began the unspeakable. The military held the government for over 16 years. And Augusto Pinochet, uh, who led the, the, the coup d'etat, imposed a totalitarian government and a neoliberal, neoliberal economic model that created wealth for some at the expense of increasing the inequality. His, uh, his dictatorship still continues in Chile through his constitution, his legacy. 
so the toll was quite high. Over the 16 years, 31,831 people were held prisoners. 9,725 survived torture. 1,102 still disappeared. Finally, on October 1988, a national plebiscite defeated Pinochet. He had called the plebiscite as a form of validation of his government to continue and extend his government for eight years more. People just said no. 30 years passed by and five presidents were elected demo democratically, but they were, there was no accountability held against Pinochet or his collaborators. The number of military agents condemned for these crimes were insignificant. And although there were some reparation, there was a policy of reparation for the victims, justice never served. And despite the economic growth, inequality and rage just simmered. So the 30 years passed and the generations changed. The new generations were not afraid to speak and they were not afraid to make their, their demands heard. The secondary students protested against this rise of the sideway ticket, a rise of 30 pesos, just four US cents. And the police repression was so violent and high that everyone in the country was upset and uprised. The, the uprising demonstration, some of them were violent and most of, most of them were peaceful. And because of the violent demonstration, President de Piñera declared a state of emergency and deployed the military forces on the streets. He stated that the country was at war. So seeing police and the military on the streets just recalled painful scenes from the dictatorship. But still millions of people just joined on peaceful demonstra demonstrations. I wanna show some of the slogans that people shared because they were unifying for us. The first one says, they took so much from us that they took our fear away. And the second said, it's not 30 years, it's, it's not 30 cent pesos, it's 30 years. So suddenly all the causes just were one for us. Gender violence against women, gender-based violence against women, the abuse of indigenous people by the government and the lack of justice for those who were disappeared and tortured. And even though the demonstrations were peaceful, the police violence was extreme. And that extreme violence just led to more violence. And after six months of daily protests, um, we had so many people in this protest for six months every day until March of 2020 when COVID arrived in Chile. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, oh, shit. I'm gonna go back here. Everyday protesters and residents were exposed to excessive use of tear gas. Even the street doctors are, were being attacked. And Carabineros, the Chilean police, kept shooting people with rubber bullets and some of them just hit them on the eyes. As a result, we had 460 people with ocular trauma. 1,234 people were victims of torture and other good treatments such as sexual abuse. 222 children were victimized. For this fellowship I, fellowship, I partnered with Amnesty International Chile, an organization that has played a key role in my country. They first started working in Chile after two months of Pinochet dictatorship and immediately made a report on and denounced these human rights violations on August 2019. The report is called Eyes on Chile. And what I've learned here as a physician and working as an epidemiologist for Amnesty International was the cases of these people. This is Natalia Ravena. Her case was documented by Amnesty. She's a 26 years old, years old nurse. And she was hit by a tear gas canister after five minutes on a peaceful demonstration. 
she um, she uses a prosthesis that she had to pay for. Still, the government government claims they paid for it and gave them for free. She's just work in a mental health institution, and she's still protesting every day in Chile. Yeah. This is Fabiola Campillay, a 36-year-old woman, um, a mother of four, who returned to her house after work and by hit and was hit by a tear gas canister as well. This is Fabiola Campillay. She lost both eyes. She is now running for Senate. This is Gustavo Gatica, a 22-year-old student who, got, who lost both eyes because of the rubber bullets. He became one of our symbols in what we call the Chilean awakening. After he, he declared, I gave my eyes so people could wake up. Mm. What I've learned about reparations in Chile is that there is still a fragmentation of the health services and people are being stigmatized and they are being re-victimized by the health workers when they make awful comments about their political uh, position. They have no paid treatments and some of the processes are really bad quality. And what I've learned is there will be no reparation without justice, the guarantee of no repetition, acknowledgement and memory. So now that we have a voice again, we will make it here until dignity becomes customary, as is this slogan says. And I will leave you with a video of a song by Victor Hara. He was detained and disappeared in 1973, just to show you how history, when it's not repaired, will repeat again. I'm not sure why we're not getting the volume. Played for me yesterday. <laughs> it's okay. You, I, it may not happen right now. Yeah. But I just want to show you how many people protest peacefully. After these people was, of course, attacked by the police. I actually lived there and it was very close. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. And uh, thank you to everyone on Zoom as well for joining. Uh, my name is Meher and my colleague Duran is joining us on Zoom as well. And I'm going to hand it over to her to introduce our topic for today. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Duran. I'm going to start presenting the slides. So over the summer, uh, we worked with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, also known as the OPCW, helping them investigate allegations of chemical weapon use. But unfortunately, since the investigations we worked on are confidential and we are bound by non-disclosure agreements, we won't be able to discuss the specific cases. Um, so instead, we're going to focus more on the general investigative process for a human rights violation and how online open source investigative techniques, also known as OSINT, um, play a role in this process. And so... First, to describe, a traditional investigation for an organization like the OPCW would consist of two main components. One would be the collection and analysis of physical evidence, and then the other would be the in-person interviewing of witnesses as well as various um, experts. And these two main types of evidence would be the basis for a larger report outlining the findings of an investigation, and this report would most likely be public. However, a traditional investigation structure like this, it's really easy to miss crucial aspects of an incident if you're only focusing on traditional evidence. Like it'd be unrealistic to assume that you wouldn't need to check online to see how an incident would unfold and what people thought about it, especially since so much of our lives are online. And like, if you know where to look, there can be so many clues um, available like on a social media platform or a website. And um, yeah, this is just kind of like a very basic way of how OSINT can help bring that online information into an investigation. Um, and now I'm gonna continue off where she left uh, and talk about the OSINT process. So uh, one really important word that comes to mind is intention when you're looking at defining the OSINT scope. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
uh, an example we're gonna use today is that it's a fun but fake example mm -hmm. that uh, Joanne wasn't invited to a fellowship event that happened in September and she really wants to know uh, where it happened, did it really happen? Am I just playing with her? Um, so the, the example, yeah, is right there. The dates we're gonna use is September 1st to September 15th. And the platforms are Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And the search terms are variations of HRC, Fellowship, Berkeley, and 2021. So a mix of those will help us find the content that's most relevant. Um, so we use this tool called TweetDeck that's publicly accessible. And um, we use different variations, different filters, and we didn't really find any evidence of anything happening in September of uh, Fellows Only event. Um, we can go to the next slide. However, when we go onto Instagram, we see that the HRC has an account. And when we go through their content, we find that on September 10th, there was indeed an event that took place for HRC fellows. Um, but we want to make sure. So we want to verify that this is genuine and it's not like a fake picture that was doctored and put online. Um, to do that, we scroll through the pictures they posted and we see that in the background, there is uh, a house and uh, knowing what the HRC house looks like, it seems very much like what we see online. Um, so this easy process of geolocation can help us verify that yes, this indeed did happen here right in the building or outside the building um, that we're present in. Um, thank you, Meher. And yeah, so with that example, we can kind of think of you know, how to practically apply OSIN and how, how can information found online help the larger investigative process. And throughout the summer, I was constantly relearning the importance of having online information just be one fraction of a much larger investigation. There really is nothing more valuable than real life interviews and real physical evidence. And that's something that, you know, can be quickly forgotten if you're only used to looking at things online. Um, and like, as Meher did, uh, exemplified, like you can't find everything online and you can't take everything you on, you find online as fact. And so the main strength in online information is how it can be used more as corroborating evidence for the facts. Um, and the reality is that these investigations, they're operating within um, a lot of bureaucratic challenges and resource limitations. So using open source methodology for certain parts of an investigation, instead of like an expensive and time consuming like real life mission, that can help alleviate um, strains on resources for other crucial mi missions. Like I think OSINT works best when its purpose is simple and it really comes down to often, it can just be easier to find something online. And now to conclude, we're going to talk about the implications of using OSINT. So us being situated here in Silicon Valley, we know that there are many benefits to technology, um, social media being one. And as OSINT investigators, we take content, user-generated content, and help verify the existence of war crimes and help deliver justice to people around the world. Um, and during COVID, we've seen how social media can be used to crowdsource like um, things like oxygen tanks in India or how it could be used to um, create social movements like BLM. Um, and personally, I feel like it is also the, for the first time that we are allowed to contribute our own versions of history and document them online. Um, however, this power of social media is not a neutral power mm -hmm. and put in the wrong hands can be, got, can be lent to worse causes. Uh, one example is the use of Facebook by uh, Myanmar's military top officials to organize and uh, propagate uh, genocide against eth ethnic minority. Um, given the, the powers that social media has, um, authoritarian governments use it for surveillance and to you know, suppress protesters and dissent within their countries. Um, ultimately, we wanna end this talk with, with an insight into how social media platforms need to incorporate more human rights-based values into their regulation, into their monitoring, so that this accessibility, accessibility that we all benefit from is a positive tool for change. Um, and if we want to live out our lives with you know, values of equity and justice, that needs to be happening online as well. Thank you. My name is Helena Von Nagy, and I'm a now third year law student at Berkeley Law. 
Um, thank you all so much for coming, both those in person and over Zoom. It's lovely to, well, I can't see most of you, but it's lovely to be in this um, space with you. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the Human Rights Center for their generous fellowship and for arranging this program where we can all speak about our work and learn more about each other's projects and share our exciting news with you all. Uh, but on that note, I'm afraid I have to begin with a small caveat. Um, I spent the summer working in the human rights and refugees section of the US State Department Office of the Legal Advisor. And so most of the material I worked on and would be otherwise very eager to tell you about is privileged information. So given the necessary limitations of my talk today, I wanted to focus on a small part of the trajectory of the US approach to international human rights, both in the last decades and going forward. And given the topic of today's panel, I thought I'd focus on the US position on and role in addressing kind of the legal aspects of crimes against humanity more generally, both our own crimes against humanity and those that occur elsewhere in the world. So on uh, September 27th of this year, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court released his decision to deprioritize the investigation into US war crimes and crimes against humanity in Afghanistan. This includes you know, torture carried out by US state agents and black sites in Poland and Afghanistan, and as well as other war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Afghanistan by US forces, um, especially drone strikes. Um, I don't, personally, I don't believe the ICC investigation was, was really ever going to hold the US accountable but nonetheless, especially now, we have to find accountability ourselves. And this is where this talk comes in. So over the summer, I worked on sort of figuring out how the US could participate in upcoming talks on draft articles on crimes against humanity, which actually started in their latest round uh, yesterday. So the International Law Commission, um, which is a group within the UN that helps to develop new international laws, uh, first proposed these draft articles for a future binding convention on crimes against humanity in 2014, and they've kind of been snowballing along. The purpose of this convention is to fill a really big gap in international criminal law. There is no convention on crimes against humanity that addresses national laws, uh, national jurisdiction, and interstate cooperation for crimes against humanity prosecutions. There are some crimes against humanity that are codified in international treaties like apartheid and forced disappearances and torture like the Convention Against Torture, but most of the crimes are not. And um, since crimes against humanity can occur, occur during peacetime, they're also not covered in various treaties that govern the law of war. So this convention would be the first treaty to one, spell out the definition of crimes against humanity for states that have not joined the International Criminal Court because the Rome Statute has definitions, two, require domestic laws to prosecute crimes against humanity, and three, establish a mechanism for interstate cooperation to prosecute those crimes. These draft articles have been ratified by about two thirds of the United Nations, but the US, as of at least the day before yesterday, I haven't checked the news, my apologies, has not officially taken a position in support or otherwise of the draft articles. But given the emphasis on international human rights by the current administration, knowing that statement is caveated, um, given the news, um, there was a general sense at the State Department that this might be a good opportunity to push for the US to either behind the scenes or openly support and participate in the negotiation of these draft articles. Now, as there is a legal office in the State Department, there are legal offices in all of the departments, and those lawyers all have opinions about how the draft articles could impact their work, although hopefully the US Postal Service doesn't commit crimes against humanity, so <laughs> maybe they're not, they're not inter uh, adding to the commentary. Um, but nonetheless, the US does care deeply about ensuring that it doesn't take on international obligations it cannot actually fulfill. So all of the lawyers in these different departments read, uh, read the 2017 version of the draft articles and they provided their feedback. And then those opinions were finally summarized into a public US commentary in 2019. And I'd like to focus uh, very briefly on one issue that the US took with the draft articles, which is the legal definition of the crime against humanity of deportation or forcible transfer, transfer of population. 
the 2017 version, as you can see on the slide, provides that deportation or forcible transfer of population means forced displacement of persons concerned, the persons concerned, by expulsion or other coercive acts from the area in which they are lawfully present without grounds permitted under international law. Now, in the 2019 commentary, the US was particularly concerned about not being accused of crimes for removing people from US territory. Think back to which administration this was and the continuing issue with deporting migrants and asylum seekers from the US. Um, so in the commentary, they wanted to ensure that the draft articles clarified that it was not a crime against humanity to remove people in a manner that was consistent with international law obligations. Of course, as you read on the last slide, that's exactly what the draft article says, without grounds permitted under international law. So the drafting committee clearly had the same reaction because the article did not change in the new version. But what's more interesting, in my opinion, is that this language comes verbatim from the Rome Statute. And you can see it's identical here. The US, of course, is not a party to the Rome Statute but we were very involved in the negotiation of the text and the elements of the crimes. So if you look at the travaux preparatoires, which are the negotiating documents from the 1998 Rome Statute negotiations, you can see the exact impact the US had on the elements of crime and the definition of deportation. Um, sorry, I think this might be a little far from where you're all sitting, but to see, and uh, apologies for the amount of text on the slide, but. Um, in 1998, the U.S. delegation stressed three things. One, that the transfer could not be justified on security, public welfare, or other lawful grounds. Two, that the perpetrator knew of the lawful residence of the individuals. And three, that it was carried out as part of a widespread and or systematic attack on the civilian population. And this third point is just part of the basic definition of a crime against humanity. The last two points, the knowledge of the lawful presence and the widespread attack, made it into the current elements of the ICC, which are on the, I think that should also be the right side of the slide for you as well. Um, and there is an argument that the first point did as well. The ICC elements of crime say that the transfer must be in violation of international law to be a crime against humanity. International law does account for security and public welfare concerns as like the ones the US raised. Uh, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, Article 12, states that everyone has the right to freedom of movement within the territory of the state. Uh, however, the state can restrict those rights if the restriction is provided by law and necessary to protect national security or public order or health or morals. So while the ICC elements of crimes version of this point about national security is vaguer, the US proposal was in a way incorporated into the Rome Statute. Thus by extension, it was incorporated into the draft articles on crimes against humanity. Now, the difference between the 1998 travaux that we see here and the 2017 comments suggest that there could be an ongoing debate within the government. So for example, if a lawyer was in favor of joining the negotiations, this lawyer could turn to a colleague who was more hesitant and say, hey, listen, this is what the US said back in 1998. This is what the specific definition is of this crime. We came up with this definition. So obviously we put a lot of thought into it, how it would affect our programs, our laws, what we do. And in this way, kind of allay the fears of the more skeptical colleague. And so maybe the skeptical colleague will join the more enthusiastic colleague in this um, coalition to get the US to join negotiations and uh, like knowing that they won't thoughtlessly open the US to prosecution for crimes against humanity, whether they would do it intentionally, that's a whole different meeting, a whole other committee. Um, but nonetheless, having this kind of dialogue, this debate means that there's one less hurdle, or could be one less hurdle for the US taking this next step for accountability. Now, I'm not gonna pretend that these draft articles on oops, crimes against humanity will be a cure-all for the US crimes. I mean, the US is a party to the Convention Against Torture and that didn't stop the CIA or the armed forces in Afghanistan. However, if there were a, a domestic part of the legislation, which is required if we join the convention, this would be a strong case, a strong basis for convicting people for crimes against humanity, both 
uh, people from the US, US citizens and, and other people. Other countries would also be able to arrest US perpetrators and try them or use the threat of trials to kickstart accountability here. This particular convention will not come in time to address the crimes against humanity in Afghanistan, but the US will continue to use drones. And if the past weeks are any example, um, thinking about the Haitian migrants, Haitian asylum seekers, the US will continue to forcibly displace people who are lawfully present in the US. And a convention on crimes against humanity with a mandate for domestic enforcement legislation would create new tools for human rights defenders to use to seek justice and accountability. The first step is a good faith engagement from the US in the negotiation process. And that happens because of attorneys at the State Department. So I began my work uh, in the law, working one-on-one -on -one with clients in woo, immigration and asylum systems. Everything's fine here, no troubles at all. <laughs> I worked with uh, clients within incredibly restrictive laws to try and get justice. And this past summer, I was given the opportunity to start changing the law so that similarly situated clients and attorneys in the future could succeed where I had failed. It's a way of changing the system and making it easier for those who come after. Thank you. All right, those are our presentations. Now we have time for some questions from the audience on Zoom or here in the room. Yes, please. Well, I'm interested in the <clears throat> hospital attacks in Syria. Are hospitals attacked specifically because they're hospitals or because they're large, large buildings with large concentrations of people, for example? Is a large office building or a power station be more or less likely than a hospital to be attacked? So they were actually, there's evidence that shows that they were directly targeted. So the, the Syrian government as well as rebel groups as well as Russia directly targeted these hospitals. Yeah. And do you, do you know what the logic is? What are they, what, what are they mostly most to gain by attacking a hospital? You know, if they spend resources attacking something, why do they gain more attacking a hospital than, say, attacking a power station or a, uh, an office building? So. Um, I think the main reason is just fear for the civilians that live in that area. Uh, as you might like, if you remember, one of my quotes showed that a lot of the civilians, if they see a hospital getting attacked, then they will just go ahead and like displace. They want to leave the city. They think it's you know, not safe for them anymore, as well as the healthcare workers, they're also afraid and they want to leave the city as well. So that's, I guess, a tactic from both parties to, you know, get control of that area by targeting this hospital and, you know, creating fear amongst the civilians and the healthcare workers. So they have no choice but to leave, if that makes sense. Yeah. Why would you think that the uh, rebels would try to get the hospitals. Are these hospitals in the rebel-controlled area or in the government? So, uh, for you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So, um, her question was, why, why do, why do I think that the rebel, the rebel groups will um, attack these hospitals? And you're right. It depends on the area. So, if it's a non-government-controlled area, then most likely, the the government. The government will attack these hospitals, but vice versa. If it's a government controlled area and there's a hospital in that region, then the rebellion groups will also target that area. Yeah. Could you study the, the hospital as the government controlled area if they were attacked? Uh, so the question was if I studied um, the area that was under cover com government control or non government control. And in my case, in the case study in Idlib, um, that region is considered a non-government controlled area. So that's the region I, I study, yeah. So this is a question for the students who did the OSIN investigation presentation. Um, I'm curious with the advent of new forms of social media like Discord and TikTok, uh, have you guys seen any tools that are allowing you to do open source investigations for those new, new social media types like with the tweet deck? Um, Joanne, or I can, I guess I can take it. Um, so I think that's been like a struggle and a, an area that I think OSINT investigators need to catch up on. There is like, I know 
some people in the back like Brian to be good at doing this because he's just a legend but <laughs> it's not it's not as accessible as um, you know Twitter or Facebook and I think a lot of these platforms don't really want people to be on there you know looking for information so um, it, there is no incentive to really like create tools like TweetDeck to you know and also I think TweetDeck is also used by um, a lot of like marketing and advertising. So we just use it for, I guess, human rights purposes, but other other um, platforms don't really have anything like that. I can also add um, to what Meher said generally about like each social media platform is different, right? And like how it operates and also how different types of like groups of people use it, right? Like the certain demographics use Facebook differently than let's say like a younger generation and so something like TikTok you have to um so you have to really think about like how that app operates which is based off of um like sounds and audios rather than something like Instagram which might be like based off of images that are tagged or stories and so like it kind I think it kind of just takes time to learn how people use an app and like how ideas are generated through it. Um, so yeah, like like Maher said, it we're definitely I feel like we're always playing catch up, which is like the reality. Any questions? Oh, here's one. Yes. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask someone that like. Why do you think, as you know, like maybe there's a one place where there are a lot of protests and like government also like uh, suppresses them in a very violent way. But why do you think there's like this specific thing like with the eye? Like I don't, I don't think that in Mexico like it's like that can be so common with like the, uh, like the hurting of the eyes. And like right now, can you say something about what the, um, like the general feeling towards like this president? Do you think like people are like kind of scared? Like is that social? Um, the civil society like getting ready for another uh, military attack? How do you feel about that? Um, I'm going to rephrase it. To say um, so Alma is asking, uh, why do I think in Chile we have this specific attack on ice? And if I think it's going to get worse now with things. And um, to be honest, I think it's a combination when the president uh, first stated that we are at war, uh, it just gave the set for people to think that we were at war. So arms could become something to use against civilians. And at the same time, of course, I didn't have much, much time to share, but uh, the people who run the police, uh, the, the general of the police force, he told them that they, he was gonna back up their actions. So the uh, police felt like they were not gonna get uh, anything like against them. They were not gonna be convicted. So they went over their pro their protocols, like shooting people from. They are supposed to be shoot people like from twenty meters. I don't know how that's in <laughs> in miles or feet, but uh, they didn't respect the the distance. And some people were shot really like close. And you can say it, it could be an accident just because you were close and you just shot, shoot, shoot it and there was tear gas everywhere so you couldn't see. But, oh, there is evidence. There are images that uh, police forces pointed at people in the eyes. So to be honest, I think sometimes just cause damage. And it's gonna be so much worse. It's the anniversary this week, coming week, the 18th. And people has been in their in their homes from the beginning of the pandemics because the president called on a state of emergency extended, and they had curfews to go out. And it's been almost two years without going to the streets, and now they are going to the streets because pandemics are kind of down, and it's getting so much more violent. This um, activist that died last Sunday, uh, there is a confusion. Nobody knows really what happened. The images are strange in the videos. But rate is coming. And the president last week stated that we are in a state of emergency against the people, our Aboriginal people. So rate is just steaming. And yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, I'm just really curious, like looking at all of like the theme, the right to the healthy lives, what you all kind of learn from each other and if you've had conversations just in the you know, cross-disciplinary connections and you know 
the whole uh, connection is like what what you see as commonalities in all of your work. All of our work. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think for me, I learned a lot about uh, Mahara and Jaren's work just uh, because for me, I did, a, mine was more on like interviews and theirs was focused more on like evidence using social media. And I feel like they're both very important. So I saw the intersection between that. Yeah. Because for me, uh, getting to learn a little bit more about open source investigation is really something I want to do because I get all these pictures, for example, the activist just died and it's an and I really feel like I wish I had the tools just to go and see and check those videos. Um, and I'd say that I think the ability that a lot of like I think both of you in particular had to work with specific people, like you know, real people, uh, hear their stories. That like empathy that goes from that is something that I like be envy in some ways because with Osin, you're doing a lot of you know, you're very far from the work you're doing so the connection doesn't grow the same way so i think that's something that i've you know found a lot of value in that they had to do that online people you want to chime in on that question yeah i'll jump in um kind of similar to the last comment a lot of international law is very separate um, very like distant from the actual victims and survivors of human rights abuses and international criminal um, abuses. And so it's been really, re really refreshing and really um, kind of motivating and, and reinforcing to hear about the work on the ground um, in investigations and, and working with human rights defenders. And it's been um, just really nice to, obviously it's not nice that these things are happening to people, but it has been very kind of like grounding to be back in touch with, with those stories and those experiences. And I mean, on the reverse side, I just, I found Helena's presentation so informative, honestly. Like I felt like I was listening to like a really like um, great lecture and I, I wanna like take a class <laughs> on, on the, um, the topics you presented. Um, cause I've always been interested in like that larger, um, what's happening, you know, in the larger, like legal world. Um, yeah. And, and I think the way that you presented the information made me feel really hopeful, which I often don't feel when I'm, you know, learning about the law. So <laughs> <laughs> we had a question over here. Uh, yeah. Um, so in, uh, it's like for two different ones, so like this one. That's fine. Um, for like the Syrian um, hospitals, um, like I'm just trying to understand like I guess in tech, right? So it's like uh, it's institute like fear through these attacks, get people to move out, and then like rule over like this empty land with like no one no one to rule over or like very few people to rule over. Is that like yeah, so um, her question was basically, what's the intention of, of, you know, creating this fear? And then so at that point, everyone leaves and then they can control this land that's pretty much empty. Honestly, that was like my same exact thought I was having when I got into this uh, research and this study. Um, but I guess that's their tactic. And if you, I, I don't remember the exact number, but as you guys know, there's millions and millions of series that are displaced not in within Syria, but outside of Syria too. So many refugees. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's like it's land. That's yeah. Land. I mean, there are of course still a few people um, that are that still do live there. Obviously, it's much less in those non-government controlled areas. Um, well, at, at this point right now, it's pretty much just Idlib. That's the only non-government controlled area. It live in some parts of Aleppo. Um, the rest are government controlled areas in Syria. So they are pretty much honing in on them at this point. And um, they will probably most likely control that area soon too. Yeah. So we'll see what happens from there. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering, it seems like through what's been presented today, there's like the both sides of social media and you presented it at the end of your, um, your talk of both like for the first time 
like every single person who's attending a, a march or protest has an evidence gathering machine in our in our pockets and that's true around the world um and there are ways for people to gather evidence as it occurs but also ways where you get in serious trouble for being somewhere you're not supposed to be or we're seeing a lot of like out of that out of hong kong protests in the aftermath of that going years later now people kind of being rounded up of if you were to talk to someone or say someone in chile right now what would you say about what you should be describing or what you should be documenting versus not um in order for there to be accountability but also to keep one's own self safe um well i think uh one good thing that came out of uh blm i remember was this awareness of like you know if you are being tracked like we're being surveilled you need to be digitally safe um so i remember uh, there were like these toolkits that people created they were spread online that helped um they told you like don't take your phone to the protest or if you take your phone like you know put it on airplane mode or basically there are these simple things that you can do to basically not be tracked and then don't post videos online of people with their faces if they're doing something that could like you know implicate them or something um so there or wear a mask or wear clothes like in the hong kong protest everyone wore black right that makes you unidentifiable you um if you're wearing a particular color, maybe they can trace, track you and like trace where you are and in, in the images and you know cross check. So I think so awareness can be used to both good and bad because then people doing bad things can also you know become unidentifiable. Like suppose in January sixth, um, you know, uh, attack on the Capitol. A very helpful thing uh, was being able to track the actual people from the videos and then eventually when they were taken to court by, uh, I'm not sure who, but the US government, um, you know, it led to accountability. So um, it's, it's always a two-sided, two-sided, you know, coin. Um, what should we specifically Yeah, and today, um, when you are attacked by your own government, I think it's really important that you take your cell phone. It's actually has given some accountability of things that uh, before you, you people didn't believe in the time of the dictatorship. Actually, the government made up and set up things like making people that been disappear. Uh, TV shows like they were the bad people, mm -hmm. and people believed it because it wasn't on TV. And now we have the chance to do all the opposite. So I'm grateful for the phones and many things. Um, and phones are being used as evidence in the courts. Is there a question up here in the front? Did you have a question? Um, yes, it was more of a general question on how you all chose your project. Was it so for some of you, I understood that it was related to personal story, but for the others, uh, was it something that you had long been interested in, or was it something that came up with like the collaboration that you had with an organization, or how did it work? Um, sure, I'll start. So her question was, how did we start? doing this the project that we're doing. Uh, for me, I've been working with Dr. Rohini Har for quite a while, uh, for the past couple of years on her Syria impact study. And she gave me this, um, sh she was basically saying, would you like to lead a, a specific case study on our, the project we're doing? And the reason she wanted to do something like this was kind of like another way of showing people what's going on. Uh, I guess more a way to like kind of illustrate like how, how what we're doing um, and kind of make it more, as a story than like like a research paper so that was like the main reason and i was very interested in that so i took on i took that project on and i'm glad i did <laughs> i learned a lot it was personal and i was involved in amnesty international when i was in med school and then, then i left it for a while and this when i knew about the fellowship it was like going back to the things that really make me vibrate and having the time for it and i really appreciate to have, uh, yeah, the generosity of people. Um, I think so for Fred and I, we were both a part of the Human Rights Center Investigations Lab, and that's where we learned OSI skills. Um, and the opportunity was presented to us through that because they had a working relationship with the OPCW. Um, and yeah, I think it's like, you know, having the right skills, having the language skills too, that helped uh, eventually, you know, create what we had, uh, this like specific fellowship in the summer. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is like confidential, so it's hard to talk about, but 
froggy. Uh, I think the Olsen scale is what pushes towards uh, this question. Folks online, you want to chime in real quick? I think my hair kind of covered it. Yeah. I think we have one question from the Zoom room. Oh, sorry, Helena. Did you want to speak? <laughs> I'll just uh, keep it quick. So um, the US State Department legal office has been known for a long time as this kind of, uh, I don't wanna call it a vanguard, but like on the forefront of the development of international law. And I felt going into the new administration that had made so many uh, statements about international human rights that it would be a really great time to work in the office given my own background in international human rights work. Um, and I was right, it turned out to be great. I can't, I can't actually talk about the work that I did, but it was a great time. And so if there are any law students who are interested in international law, I would highly recommend applying because it's actually a really fun job, so. That was a great question to wrap it up with. So real quick, I should do a, a fast product placement for the Human Rights Investigations Lab here at the Human Rights Center since we've been talking about it so much. We have some distinguished graduates of this program here with us today. Students who are interested, <laughs> who are currently enrolled, please come talk to us more if you'd like to join the lab as a student. Um, also, I should give a shout out to Berkeley Law's International Human Rights Law Clinic uh, if you're interested in doing international human rights law. Finally, I should mention uh, next week, we have Youth and Education and Human Rights Stories from Young People Around the World, October 28th, here, same time, same place, Identity, Place, and Justice, Elevating Community Voices in Legal and Land Conflicts. And finally, on November 4th, Thursday the 4th, Challenging Dehumanization, Demanding the Rights of the Displaced, the Undocumented, and the Disappeared. If you haven't had lunch, feel free to grab some on the way out. Everything is compostable. Everybody, thank you so much for coming today. I'd like to follow.